Now, seeking the Lord's blessing, we're going to turn to Galatians chapter 1 as we continue our study through Paul's letter to the Galatians. This morning, we're going to be looking at verses 6 through 9. Galatians chapter 1, verses 6 through 9. And let's ask the Lord's blessing upon our time together. Our Father in heaven, we ask you to please bless the preaching, the teaching of your holy word. We pray that you would be pleased to grant our understanding and right application of this truth that you have recorded for us, which contains within it precious truth, truth that is necessary for eternal life. And we pray that you would be pleased to bless us then helping us to be attentive, and, O Lord, that through this even, your name would be glorified. We pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Well, let's look now at Galatians chapter 1 and verses 6 through 9. Paul writes here, I am astonished that you are so quickly deserting him who called you in the grace of Christ and are running to a different gospel. Not that there is another one, but there are some who trouble you and want to distort the gospel of Christ. But even if we or an angel from heaven should preach to you a gospel contrary to the one we preach to you, let him be accursed. As We have said before, so now I say again, if anyone is preaching to you a gospel contrary to the one you received, let him be accursed. And thus far the reading of God's holy word. Well, if you'll remember, last week we compared the beginning of this letter to the Galatians to the other letters of the Apostle Paul. And you will remember that unlike those other letters, the Apostle Paul here does not begin with thanksgiving. And he doesn't begin with saying, uh, uh, giving a blessing to the Lord, as it were, blessing his name for his mighty works. Rather, Paul, with this letter, begins with an abrupt statement, an alarming statement. I am astonished. I am astonished. And what was it that astonished the Apostle Paul? It was that the Galatian churches were abandoning the gospel. They were turning to a new message of salvation. He's astonished by that. But he's also astonished with how quickly this has taken place. One might ask, should he have been surprised that they were turning away to God so quickly to another gospel? After all, doesn't the Bible from the very beginning tell us over and over again how man turns away from God? How there's a continual defection, turning away, departure from God. There was man's first departure in the Garden of Eden. Adam and Eve turning away from the commandments of God, plunging mankind into sin. And then shortly after the gospel is given, there's a turning away of Cain into or toward another gospel and another place. Over and over we find man turning away from God. Israel continually departed from the Lord. Perhaps the New Testament would bring something new. Perhaps the New Testament would be an age, now that Christ has come, it would be an age where there wouldn't be such departure, and yet there is. There is. And it's surprising when it happens. And it's surprising that it can happen so quickly. These opening words, the Apostle Paul expressing his astonishment that the Galatians are turning to a different gospel. Now, within these words found in verses 6 through 9, 
There are three fundamental things that you and I must remember and cherish. Three fundamental things that you and I must remember and cherish. Now, the first thing that we must remember and cherish is this, that there is only one gospel. There is only one gospel. Look at verses 6 and 7. I'm astonished that you are so quickly deserting him who called you in the grace of Christ and are turning to a different gospel. Not that there is another one. Not that there is another one. Because there is no other gospel. Our faith is a narrow faith. This is narrowness. This is exclusivity exclusivity I don't know if that's correct it's an exclusive faith it's completely contrary to the spirit of our age it's contrary to the spirit of all generations really the exclusive nature of the Christian faith flies against relativism against wokeism against political correctness you mean there's only one true religion Well, the Bible says, yes, there is only one gospel. There is only one door into heaven, and that door is Jesus Christ. There is only one gate, and that gate is a narrow gate. Maybe you know what it's like trying to move a large piece of furniture into a particular room in the house, and it just won't fit. There's no way that you can get it in there. Maybe you know what it's like uh, to be having to try to fit through a narrow, a narrow uh, passageway and you just can't make it through. I remember working on a project in the house and like every weekend tool man, I'd like to have the opportunity to put on my tool belt, right? And I wanted to walk through the studs of a wall with my tool belt on. And you attempt that a few times and you realize it's too narrow, I have to take off the tool belt in order to make it through this narrow opening. And the gospel is a narrow opening. You have to take off all of your good works, anything that you think makes you acceptable. They all have to be left down on the ground in order to make it through that narrow gate. The gospel is a narrow path. It's a narrow lane, a one person walkway into heaven we can only go into heaven by walking single file following each saint that went before us going through the one door jesus christ through the narrow gate of christ jesus it's not a broad road where mobs of people just kind of saunter along side by side under any banner they please Jesus says, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. Now, the world hates this idea of exclusiveness. It's just one more reason for the world to oppose God. But this is what the Bible teaches. There is only one gospel. Jude says, we read it earlier, I was very eager to write to you about our common salvation. I found it necessary to write appealing to you to contend for the faith that was once for all delivered to the saints. Now pay attention to these words. The faith that was once for all delivered to the saints. It's virtually the same thing as what Paul is saying here in Galatians. We preach to you the one true gospel. Look again at verses 8 and 9. But even if we or an angel from heaven should preach to you a gospel contrary to the one we preach to you, let him be accursed. As we've said before, so now I say again, if anyone is preaching to you a gospel contrary to the one you received, let him be accursed. There's no other gospel other than the one that Paul originally preached to them. 
Now, this proves, by the way, the gospel, or the, uh, excuse me, this proves, by the way, the doctrine of sola scriptura, right? The Bible alone. You see, the Bible, which contains the gospel preached by the apostles, has been delivered to the saints. The entirety of the Christian faith is found in the scripture, in the Bible. And the gospel can only be found in the Bible. That's why Paul says, listen, even if I came to you, if we came to you and started saying something different than what's already been delivered in the word, let him be a curse. You know, the root cause of apostasy whether it's the apostasy of the Orthodox or Roman Catholic heresy, is that the gospel is not understood as having been delivered in its totality in the scriptures. They believe that the church fathers and tradition have been completing or perfecting the gospel, the many articles of faith that Rome says that a person must believe, which are not found in the Bible. That assumes then that the gospel has not been given. And yet Paul and Jude clearly state for us that it has been delivered and it is found in the Holy Bible. This is one of the fundamental truths that you and I must remember and cherish. There is only one gospel. Now, don't be ashamed of that. The world will want to make you ashamed of that narrowness. But don't be bothered if the world hates you for being narrow-minded. The Lord commands you to be narrow-minded. He commands everyone to be narrow-minded. There is only one gospel. That's the first precious truth for us to remember and cherish here. Now, a second fundamental truth that you and I should remember and cherish from these verses, and that is that if anyone distorts or changes the gospel, that one is to be accursed. That one is to be a curse. This shows us how important this is. Again, look at verses 8 and 9. But even if we or an angel from heaven should preach to you a gospel contrary to the one we preach to you, let him be accursed. As we have said before, so now I say again, if anyone is preaching to you a gospel contrary to the one you received, let him be accursed. Now, this word, accursed, this is the word anathema. And this is the strongest accursed, the strongest type of curse that can be uttered. This word literally means to be yielded up to the wrath of God. It means to be devoted to destruction. You remember how the city of Jericho was to be entirely devoted to destruction. That's the, that's the word here that is being used. To be cursed here. This means cursed with the judgment of hell. Now, there are many who want to water this down. There are many who want to say, oh, the Apostle Paul isn't really speaking about hell here. He's just speaking about excommunication or removal from office. If there's a, a minister or a preacher who's not preaching the gospel, then remove him from the church. Remove him from his office. But that's not what Paul is saying. He is speaking about the curse of hell. He's not speaking about excommunication because angels aren't to be excommunicated from the church. Of course, it should go without saying that if there is a minister who is preaching another gospel or who has so distorted the gospel that it is no longer the gospel, he should be removed from office and excommunicated from the church. Of course, 
But that's because, as God says here, let that one be devoted to destruction. That's how serious it is. It shows us how important the gospel must be protected and taught. The reason why it's so important is because the gospel magnifies God's glory. The gospel magnifies the greatness of his love. You know, a parent's favorite child book, Guess How Much I Love You. Right. What, child, what parent is there who can read that book to a, a toddler child without getting watery-eyed by the last page? I love you to the moon and back. Well, God's love is greater than the size of the universe. He created the universe so immense to give us an idea of how great his love is for us. God sent his son, his only begotten son, to die for our sins. That magnifies the greatness of his love. And to replace that with some other teaching tarnishes the greatness and glory of God. Now notice, if anyone, if anyone is teaching another gospel. It doesn't matter who it is. Paul says, even if it's me or another apostle, if it's an angel, even if an angel came and began to speak another gospel, that individual should be accursed. Have you ever wondered why it is that Christians get led away into another gospel? by certain teachers, why is it that people are led astray by heretics? You would think it would be easy to spot the bad guy, <coughs> right? That the one who would, you know, stand up in the pulpit would look really scary and mean. Strikingly in church history, during the modernist, the liberal versus the uh, fundamentalists, you know, that the main leader of the liberals during that time was a man named Sloan Coffin. You would think that would give it away. But you see, it's not just an appearance or outward. Even if an apostle, even if an angel, why is it that people are led? Sometimes it's because of simply the position that a, a teacher or minister holds. This is a pastor this is a great theologian who teaches at a renowned institution. This is a respected professor. Certainly such an important man must be listened to. So there's just a, well, he's the authority, and therefore uh, this must be true. That's one reason why people get led astray. Another reason is because this person is so nice so kind, so loving, so fun to be around. This individual never condemns anyone. You know, uh, J. Uh, Gresham Machen, uh, speaking about the modernist and fundamentalist movement, uh, he went and studied theology in Germany and was taught by some of these liberal theologians in Germany. And he even says that he almost was carried away because of their kindness and friendliness and the way that they would serve people. Jeff Kingswood wrote a paper once called Servetus Was a Nice Guy. And Servetus was the anti-Trinitarian, and that was the title of his paper. He was a nice guy. You know, Arminius was a nice guy too. Lots of people liked him. And this is a reason why people are led astray into another gospel is simply because the teacher is nice. Well, another reason is that a teacher may be very gifted, may be very smart, an amazing communicator. Well, it doesn't matter. Paul says, let him be accursed. Now, this is not the language of toleration, is it? 
There's no toleration here. You know, it's interesting. One of the reoccurring strategies of heretics is to persuade the church to be tolerant toward heretics. Don't condemn people who preach a different gospel. Allow people to believe and teach what they want to teach. We speak of the word liberals, right? We talk about liberals and liberalism in the church. Do you know where that word comes from? When we talk about liberal, who's a liberal in the church? It comes from the expression liberty of conscience. Liberty of conscience. Allowing people to be free to believe what they want to believe. Give them liberty of conscience. Let them be free to believe what they want to believe. This is a complete twisting of the meaning of that expression in the Reformation, in the Westminster Confession, when it speaks about liberty of conscience. What the Reformers in the Westminster Assembly meant by liberty of conscience was that a believer is not subject to or a slave to the false teaching of others. A believer owns only allegiance to what the Bible teaches. And so if there's a leader or someone else who's saying, here's what you must believe, and that's not found in the Bible, then you are free not to follow along with that. You have liberty of conscience. I don't have to follow that false teaching. But you see, the liberals change the meaning of this phrase, liberty of conscience, to mean that a person is free to believe and teach whatever his or her conscience moves them to teach or to believe. And so, for example, during the time of the Synod of Dort, the Arminians pleaded for toleration. Toleration. You don't have to agree with us but just allow us to have a place in the church. Don't close us down. Don't shut us out. And then again, the modernist as well in the 20th century who rejected the inspiration and authority and inerrancy of scripture, who rejected the miracles of the Bible, who rejected the gospel altogether and replaced it with a social gospel. All they were arguing for was toleration. Let us be together. Just allow us a place in the church. Well, here in Galatians 1 and verses 8 and 9, we find no toleration. No toleration is given to any who would distort the gospel once delivered in Scripture. That's something that you and I need to remember and cherish. Well, then a third thing, a third fundamental truth that you and I should remember and keep is the truth that a Christian church can very quickly turn away from the gospel. We need to remember that. So we be vigilant when it comes to hearing, listening, evaluating, preaching. Paul, you see, has these two reasons for astonishment. One is that they are abandoning the gospel, but secondly that it was so quickly done. I am astonished that you are deserting him who called you into the grace of Christ. I am astonished that you are turning to a different gospel. It's not even another gospel because there is no other gospel. Now we've already noted from these verses that there is only one gospel. And we've already noted that if anyone distorts this gospel, he is to be devoted to destruction and hell. But now we're looking at how the Galatians were turning away from it. But perhaps you've already noticed that I have not yet even said what the gospel is. What is the gospel? Could you summarize the gospel in a few words? What is the gospel? The gospel is salvation By grace alone, through faith alone, in Christ alone. Salvation, you see, is all of God's work. You and I contribute nothing to salvation. Salvation begins 
with God's love toward us while we were still sinners, while we were dead in sin. Salvation starts with God's sovereign initiative to save us. His electing us, his sending Jesus to save us, to die for us, his sending his spirit to give us a new birth and to continue that work in us all the way through. There is nothing that we can do or contribute to our salvation. It is entirely of God's grace from start to finish. Now, a different gospel was being introduced to the Galatians, and we find this happening over and over again throughout history. And what is it that was being introduced to the Galatians? Is that the work of Christ alone, salvation by grace alone, was not, in fact, the gospel. They were saying that there are some works that must be done in order for one to be justified. There must be some works that must be added in order for a Christian to finish the race and end up in heaven. Simply put, the true gospel is faith which justifies and the result of that is doing good works from thankfulness. Faith which justifies and the result is doing good works out of thankfulness. The false gospel is faith plus doing good works results in justification. You see how terrible that is? And it's an amazement, the Apostle Paul would say. It's an amazing thing that people would move away from grace. The idea that it is God who saves. It is Christ who has done everything. It is only by faith or through faith that we may be justified. Why is it that people would move away from that in order to embrace faith plus works in order to be saved. But you know, it's interesting when you think about it. This non-gospel, this false gospel, faith plus works, it really feeds human pride. It really feeds human pride. Because as, as soon as you begin to think about your salvation being dependent on your works, on things that you do, then immediately you start comparing yourself to other people. Immediately you begin to start to see yourself as better than others. If there is any salvation to be had through works, then surely I have obtained that through my works. There's something good about myself. It leads to pride. Another reason why it's uh, appealing is that this idea of faith plus works, this false gospel, it really lowers the severity of sin. It lowers the standard of God's law. In fact, it causes people to think that most sins really God doesn't even care about. You know, because it's so easy through my works to gain favor with God. This is why people are attracted to faith plus works. But there can be no adding to the work of Christ. Righteousness can only come as a gift. It's only something, it can only be had by God giving to you. It's only through Jesus Christ from beginning to end. And this has always been taught in the scripture from the very beginning. When God provided the coats of skin for Adam and Eve, they had to take off the fig leaves that they made for themselves. God had to provide a whole new set of clothing. You remember in the law of Moses, Leviticus 19, Deuteronomy 22, it's stated there that the people were not allowed to wear clothing 
with two different materials, mixed of two different kinds of materials. You couldn't have wool with linen. It had to be only one material. Why? Because there can't be a mixture when it comes to the covering, the atonement, the justification that God provides. It is only Christ who covers and saves, not Christ plus your works. There's no blending. This is what we must remember because our hearts are prone to moving away from this true and pure gospel. A body of professing Christians can quickly turn aside from this true and only gospel. And that's why you and I must be vigilant, must pay attention to what is preached and what is taught from the pulpit of one's church. Well, let's uh, close in prayer and then we will come to the Lord's table. Our Father in heaven, we thank you that you have delivered to us the gospel and its purity in the Holy Scriptures. We thank you for the clarity of this salvation. We thank you that you, Lord Jesus, so plainly tell us that there is no way to the Father except through you. And Lord, we pray that you would help us to uh, guard against any notion of contributing to or adding to uh, this salvation as if there would be something that would, we, that would merit uh, our justification that we would produce. May we only understand and see and believe that it is through the finished work of Jesus Christ, all of his righteousness, that we can only receive by believing and trusting in him that this is the only way that we can be saved. And may we, O oh Lord, in knowing this, know the happiness, the joy, and thereby then thankfulness, uh, serving you with thankfulness from our hearts. We pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen.